It's time to reboot your credit card with Apple Card. Apple Card is a different kind of credit card. It gives you up to 3% unlimited cash back on everything you buy. It's real cash that never expires or loses value. And you can use it on anything. Grab a morning coffee, pick up a tab or pay back a friend. Apply now in the Wallet app on iPhone and start using it right away. Apple Card issued by Goldman Sachs Bank USA, Salt Lake City branch. Subject to credit approval. Daily Cash is available via Apple Cash Card issued by Green Dot Bank, member FDIC, or as a statement credit. Terms apply. I think everyone in our musical is a human being, which means that everyone has stakes. Everyone is considered. That's because when you elevate one character, you, everybody's elevated, and it makes for a better story. Welcome back to Working. I'm your host, Karen Hahn. And I'm your other host, Isaac Butler. Hello, Isaac. So, who- Hello, Karen. <laughs> So who did you talk to for this week's episode? Well, Karen, I talked to the great Susan Laurie Parks. Uh, She is a a writer. She's won the Pulitzer Prize. She's a playwright. She's a screenwriter. She's all sorts of things. And she Mm -hmm. is having quite the year. A uh, critically acclaimed revival of her masterpiece, Top Dog Underdog, just finished its run on Broadway recently. And she's got two new projects at the Public Theater where she's the writer in residence. The one we're really focusing on today is her stage adaptation of The Harder They Come, the landmark 1972 Jamaican and crime movie starring Jimmy Cliff that mm-hmm. helped popularize reggae in the United States. Oh, wow. That's fascinating. Adaptation is such a strange process. Like, how yeah. do you retell a story that already exists in a meaningful way? I'm so excited to listen to your conversation, especially because film and theater are such different mediums. But before we get to that, can you let us in on what Slate Plus listeners can look forward to this week? Well, you know, if I do say so myself, I think it's a really fun segment. (laughs) Susan Laurie Parks did this project like 15 years ago called 365 Days, 365 Plays, Mm -hmm. where she wrote a play every day for a year. And then companies would perform like a week's worth of plays. So like seven plays, you know, would go up in these sort of 52 presentations all over the country. And I wanted to talk to her about that for a few reasons. First of all, I actually directed one of the weeks of them. (laughs) And also, you know, we've talked a lot on this show about about daily artistic practices, right? Mm -hmm. Morning pages or, you know, June and I recently talked about having 10 ideas a day or whatever. And I wanted to talk about it in that context and just find out what it was like to try to do that. Mm Mm-hmm. And then after that, we have a little conversation about an actual technical thing in writing that she has pioneered that's called The Spell. But I'm not going to tell you what that is. You're actually (laughs) going to have to listen to Slate Plus to find out. Well, I don't know what it is, so I cannot wait to check that segment out. Slate Plus members will hear that at the end of the episode. But if you're not a Slate Plus member but want to know what The Spell is, why not join Slate Plus? As a member, you will never get any ads on any of our podcasts. You'll get unlimited reading on the Slate site and you'll get member exclusive episodes and segments from our show and other shows like The Waves, Culture Gab Fest and Amicus. Sign up for Slate Plus now at slate.com slash working plus to access all of Slate's content and to support our work. All right, let's hear Isaac's conversation with Susan Laurie Parks. Susan Laurie Parks, thank you so much for joining us today on Working. Thanks for having me, Isaac. This is really fun. So let's just start with the most basic of questions. Where are you in your creative process right now, today? What are you up to? You know, you're in previews right now for The Harder We're, They Come, we, right? Yeah, Isaac, we are in previews. And, you know, there, there's, a, there's a letting go. of, of the. I've been working on this project for like almost 10 years. Mm. I'm the, the longest running, quote unquote, creative, you know, what they call the writer, the director, that, the, you know, that kind of thing. I'm the longest running creative on this project, and now is the time when we're in previews, and I'm sitting back and taking fewer and fewer notes of my own, you know, of what needs to be worked on, changed, edited, tweaked, mm. 
So we're letting it go. We're, we're giving and joyful. Oh, we're having the best audiences. The audiences are great. They're loving it. So it's, it's a it's a joyful process, but it's also kind of. Meh. But you're still yeah. You're letting go of something. There's a little grief there. I yeah. I find when I you know when when a big project. You know, you get that like post-show depression or you just got to got to mourn it a little bit. Yeah. What is the size of the kinds of rewrites you're doing right now? Is it small stuff? Is it new scenes? Is it, you know, It's fairly small stuff. Yeah. We rehearse from, you know, one o'clock in the afternoon to like 430 or five. And then they take their dinner break and then they come back and they do the show at seven. So there's a limited amount of time when we're in previews to actually implement any of these changes. So every day I have a list of changes. The director, Tony Taccone, has a list of changes. You know, and the producers are chiming in with their suggestions and recommendations. And, of course, the actors are having their suggestions and recommendations and all the departments, all the designers. Very limited window of time every day. And so we have to be very particular about what gets in. The changes I want to make, word changes, I might want to change a sentence. I might get a note from the, our cultural consultants or our dialect coach where we might have to judge a word to make it more authentically Jamaican uh, 1972. Right now, my biggest thing is I want to combine two of the scenes toward the end. So that's on the waiting list. So the harder they come is, of course, based on the now 50-year-old uh, uh, yeah. rude boy crime classic, as famous for its soundtrack, probably, mm-hmm. uh, uh, as for the film itself, um, right. starring the great Jimmy Cliff, who also wrote most of the songs. Where did the idea to adapt this film to the stage originate? Were you approached by producers, or was this something you yeah. always wanted to do? Or No, no, bro. I was minding my own business. <laughs> and apparently, you know, Justine Hensel, who's the daughter of Perry Hensel, who's the film's director, had, uh, not apparently, she told me, she said she had seen Top Dog Underdog way back in 02 in New York when we were on Broadway for the first time. And she was like, that's the person I want to adapt the film into a stage musical. And so uh, she got all her ducks in a row, got in touch with Washington Square Films, and they got in touch with me, and here we are. And what was your background with the film before you were hired? Were you a big fan of it or had you seen it? Or I'm not quite old enough to have seen it. You know, uh, some people say I saw it in the movie theater and wow, it was a thing. I, you know, that wasn't, that wasn't my uh, age group. But I did remember feeling when I watched it uh, years ago, oh, wow, uh, my people are so beautiful. Mm, mm-hmm. That's the feeling I had. And that's the feeling that I, I am bringing to the project now. Mm. And is this your first adaptation? Have you done adaptations before? Oh, yeah. I'm, yeah adaptation is, is one of my middle names. Yeah. Um, I've adapted uh, various novels. I've adapted uh, Their Eyes Are Watching God, the Zora Neale Hurston right. novel for Oprah Winfrey Presents. That was a while ago. I've worked in musicals like uh, Unchained My Heart, the Ray Charles musical, uh, musicals on Broadway, the Gershwin's Porgy and Bess, that, an adaptation oh, right, that right, was yeah. Um, yeah. You know, brought to us by the Gershwin estate. They wanted it, us to transform their well-known opera into a more traditional Broadway musical. Um, so I've done, yeah, I've done a lot of adaptations. Do you have like a way that you approach adaptation that's come out of all of that experience? Do you have certain ways that you think about it or a kind of codified process or does it really matter what the piece is going to be or what it is? I mean, it's like in the, what is it? When the, the general has a, a battle plan, but when she is in the battle, she is in the moment. Mm-hmm. Or as Sister Wendy would say, I surrender myself to the story. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, Sister Wendy, the wonderful woman who uh, talks about art so yeah. brilliantly. Um, so, you know, we surrender ourselves to the story. And by surrendering myself to the story, I get a very clear idea about uh, what's needed mm. and what I might offer. I also feel as if I'm walking with the originators of the of the story. Um, in this case, it was an historical character, and then it was Perry Hensel and Trevor Roan. And is there a lot of research as part of that process? Like, were you, I don't know, reading up on rude boy culture or, you know... Uh... Sure, enough research to get me going, but really watching the film and really, again, paying attention to the characters mm-hmm. and their story. It's not an historical document, you know what I mean? Right. 
It's not a travel brochure. It's a story about a young man who comes to Kingston with, uh, you know, our musical is a story about a young man who comes to Kingston and wants to make a record. Right. That's his desire. I'm going to make a record, you know. I'm going to be a star. That's his desire uh, at, at the top of our musical. And uh, we watch him uh, navigate the, his, his new life in the, in the big city mm. uh, in pursuit of that dream. Right. But, but you don't necessarily follow the film, you know, story beat by, by story beat. You've actually made like quite a few changes to the, you know, maybe the flavor of certain moments or, you know, uh, certain characters and things like that. And can you, can you walk me through kind of that process about when you decide I'm going to go my own way on this choice or when you decide, well, for a stage musical, we need to do X. Less so for like a stage musical, we need to do X mm-hmm. because, um, while I'm very respectful of the form of a stage musical, I know that we really need to, like Sister Wendy says, surrender ourselves to the story. Right. And what does this story need, you know, in this form? So, for example, you know, the, the film, beautiful film opens with that bus winding through the landscape, you know, on its way to Kingston. And we hear the song, You Can Get It If You Really Want. Now, the, the big question when you turn a film like that into a a live action musical is, and that film very specifically had pretty much one song in the whole film, I might be mistaken, but one song that actually came out of the main character's mouth, right? Right. Most of that brilliant music is uh, underscoring, is background music. Right. Right? So, for example, when we, see, when we hear the song, you can get it if you really want it at the top of the film, uh, Jimmy Cliff is not sing- sitting on the bus singing it. Right. Right? Yeah. We just, we hear it. It's brilliant. It's gorgeous. It's brilliantly done. You can get it if you really want. You can get it if you really want. You can get it if you really want. But you must try. Try and try. Try and try. You'll succeed at last. In our musical, we have to create, I had to create a dramatic context for each of those moments so that a character might sing them. Right, 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 right. Which feels effortless at this point. It looks effortless. <laughs> People are like, yeah, it's amazing, but it wasn't no small feat. It was, a, it was a great artistic challenge, something I'm very proud of, that each moment feels earned, resonates beautifully, you know, just is fits really, really nicely. Right, because, you know, there's that kind of, like, standard, easy-to-parody way of being, you know, where a character might say, well, you might feel a lot of pressure and then sing pressure right. drops or whatever, right? You know, the, right. the like, uh, bad jukebox musical version. Right. How did you avoid right. that trap? Right. Again, you had to really immerse yourself in the vibe, in the, in the spirit of the song mm-hmm. and in the spirit of the story. So, so for example, the first moment, that's pretty, you know, you can get it if you really want. Ivan can sing that, and the whole of Kingston can sing that as the opening number. That, that's pretty beautiful. But that's not all we hear in the opening number. We also hear a song called He Will Save You, which is my, Susan Laurie Parks' riff on You Can Get It. Right. We begin to wind through the play, through the musical, um, the Holy Redeemer Band. Because we're going to have a very strong church-based religious element in the story, and I wanted to start it right at the jump. Which is interesting because in the film, you know, they're introduced. The introduction of the church stuff in the film is really wild. It's you know, suddenly the action stops and we're in this church service, and you're exactly. like, "Where's Jimmy Cliff? Where would he go?" And then exactly. you know, he's appearing in these kind of love scenes that are intercut, and then it, exactly. it's only later that you get the exposition of how he came to be there and and et cetera, et cetera, and so forth. Exactly, and in a a kind of writing that that's really rich in story, we want to show how all these elements are interconnected. Mm-hmm. Through song, which is the story of our musical, this young man, Ivan, right, brought this whole world together through his song. Right. They would not have had nothing to do with each other if it hadn't been for Ivan coming to town and saying, I want to make a record. I want to be a star. And suddenly you have all these people interacting who never would have interacted. Mm, And that's the story we're telling. And so we start that story underneath the story from the very first scene of the, of the show. 
Right. And part of what you're saying here hints at, of course, that, and you've worked in film as well, you know, the difference yeah. between the visual medium of film where so much storytelling can be done without anyone saying anything, right? <laughs> and and right, the stage right, where right. often you actually do need language to effectively tell people what's going on. And that must have created a whole lot of needs and shifts throughout. Sure, but I also think, um, if I may be so bold, I, I think we've really um, told a better story. Mm. Um, I don't think we've just added words because yeah, yeah. plays need words. You know what I mean? I think we've actually deepened the story. I think everyone in our musical is a human being, which means that everyone has stakes. Everyone is considered, mm. you know? For example, the, the policeman, the, the, the victim of the crime in the, in the show, if anybody who's seen the film will know there's crime in the, sh- in, the, in the film, in the story. But the victim of the crime in our show is given a name, and that's just not some PC bullshit. Right. Oh, let's give him a name. No, please. That's because when you elevate one character, you, everybody's elevated. When you consider one person, everybody is considered, and it makes for a better story. Well, it sounds like what you were doing is, you know, both broadening the canvas of the film and moving it in a more humanist direction in a more, maybe that's the wrong term for it, but in a more, in a, in a direction where, you know, cause the film is really, you know, it's really focused on Ivan for most of it, but, but yeah, here we're yeah, sort of trying yeah. to, you know, let the other characters have their humanity be recognized. Well, and, and yes, let their other characters have the, their humanity be recognized. Thanks for that phrase, Isaac. And, and in turn, the ultimate payoff is, is that we actually more thoroughly recognize Ivan's mm. humanity. Mm-hmm. You see what I mean? Everyone is elevated. That's what I mean. Yeah. So, for example, we give, we give Elsa some more agency, some more expand her humanity. Daisy, the mother, expand her humanity. The preacher, expand his humanity. Everybody is expanded, and suddenly we get to know Ivan that much better. And Ivan, I mean, it does strike me that, you know, one of the things that's going on as well is that Ivan is, a, is treated differently than he is in the film. I mean, in the film, to give one example of a change between the stage musical and the film is that uh, mm-hmm. when Ivan's bike is stolen in the film, he Mm -hmm. slashes the face of the person who's stolen the bike, right? In rage, Mm -hmm. they get into an Mm -hmm. argument, he Mm -hmm. pulls a knife. Mm -hmm. In in the stage musical, it's handled very differently. He goes to kind of, he gets sort of in this altercation, he tries to do something, he he actually doesn't land a blow, and he winds up in prison anyway. You know, for example. He he still slashes the face, though. Does he? Maybe I missed it. Okay, I did. It's okay, it's okay, it's okay. He slashes Lyle's face, the helper. Got it. And he's also, also, he's in a physical right. fight with the preacher. Right, which is very different, as opposed to which is, which is different. Lyle, yeah. Well, because as the preacher says in the film and in the play, in the musical, I may be a man of God, but I'm still a man. Right, right. And and I I was like, that is important. Totally. This man who was in love with Elsa, this preacher, is a man, and when his beloved Elsa is going to go off with with Ivan, he is angry. Right. As he should be. Um, so Ivan still slashes somebody's face and still says his, those famous lines, don't you fuck with me. Um, you know, we still get all of that. So we just put a few, right. few more instruments in, the, in that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that more, makes sense. Yeah, you know, we got horns, we got, you know, we got the drum kit going, you know, we got, yeah. So, so the whole community is like, what the fuck, you know, is going on right now? It's not just Ivan and, 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 and the helper guy. It's, mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, And I do feel like, I mean, maybe I'm wrong about this as well, but I do feel like Ivan's attitude towards the shooting of the police officer and sort of in the second half of the film, his, his, his attitude, you know, he, he gets kind of excited about being this outlaw, you know, in the second half of the, in the film, whereas in the, in the musical, he has a somewhat different journey that, that seems to lead to genuine remorse that seems to lead to a very different choice about the, the, how it ends. Yeah. He has a very different, he has a different take on it because just like in the movie though, I think we could say it was an accident. It was an accident in the film. Um, I think he just, he drew and shot without thinking in the film. He draws and shoots without thinking right. in the, in the musical, but he is, I think more freaked out by his, his crime in the musical. He's disturbed by it. And yet, and yet, he's on a high. Right. 
which is interesting. He's, he's disturbed and he's on a high. He's both. Right. We'll be back with more of Isaac's conversation with Susan Laurie Parks right after this. It's time to reboot your credit card with Apple Card. Apple Card is a different kind of credit card. It gives you up to 3% unlimited cash back on everything you buy. It's real cash that never expires or loses value. And you can use it on anything. Grab a morning coffee, pick up a tab or pay back a friend. Apply now in the Wallet app on iPhone and start using it right away. Apple Card issued by Goldman Sachs Bank USA, Salt Lake City branch. Subject to credit approval. Daily cash is available via Apple Cash Card issued by Green Dot Bank, member FDIC, or as a statement credit. Terms apply. This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Most of you listening right now are probably multitasking. Yep, while you're listening, you're probably also driving or cleaning, exercising, maybe even grocery shopping. But if you're not in some kind of moving vehicle, there's something else you could be doing right now. Getting an auto quote from Progressive Insurance. It's easy and you could save money by doing it right from your phone. Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save nearly $700 on average, and auto customers qualify for an average of seven discounts. Discounts for having multiple vehicles on your policy, being a homeowner, and more. So just like your favorite podcast working, Progressive will be with you 24-7, 365 days a year, so you're protected no matter what. Multitask right now. Quote your car insurance at Progressive.com to join the over 29 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates, national average 12-month savings of $698 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2021 and May 2022. Potential savings will vary. Discounts not available in all states and situations. Listeners, we want to hear from you. Whether it's to ask us for advice on a creative problem, tell us a guest you'd like to hear on the show, or to share your own creative triumphs with us, drop us a line at working at slate.com or give us a ring at 304-933-WORK. And if you're enjoying this episode, don't forget to subscribe to Working wherever you get your podcasts. All right, now let's return to Isaac's conversation with Susan Laurie Parks. So I'm also interested, of course, obviously in in this being a, a stage musical, you've already spoken some about, you know, figuring out ways to weave the songs in. I, I'm also very curious because your own songs appear in it. Your own songs are also appearing in uh, plays for the Plague Gear, which is going up later this season or being remounted later this season, uh, Joe's Pub. I remember many years ago seeing a very early workshop of Father Comes Home from the Wars in which you appeared on stage and narrated and sang original songs. And I was, you know, and so uh, ever since then, I've always been like, where's the SLP original songs? You know, like uh, I've been, you know, and, and now they've shown up. So how did you come to the point where you're like, you know what? I'm putting my original songs in this. They're going right. to be part of this process. Mm. I want to write in this musical idiom that the show is in, you know, et cetera, et cetera, and so forth. Right. Well, first, I have to say how kind of you to have gone to an early incarnation of Father Comes Home from the Wars. Yeah, that was like in 08 or 09 or something. Yeah. Yeah. So when I was working on The Heart of They Come, there were some, I had the whole Jimmy Cliff catalog and I could pull whatever Jamaican classics that we felt we needed. And that was a great luxury. The producers really made that happen. Wow. Really, great, yeah, great on them, you know, really, because securing rights for all these songs is not easy and they've done a wonderful job. Um, right, we should say, you know, Desmond Decker's Israelites is in there. Um, yeah. Toots and the Maytals, Sweet and Dandy, of course, is in there. It was in I there, can see clearly now, which Clifton Wright, but, but he had a very famous version of, is the act two <laughs> opener. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, which gets us a lot of laughs. It's right. so fun. Um, so, but, but there were moments. I had my iPad, two iPads flipping, and I was writing, you mm-hmm. know, flipping through Spotify and Apple Music and whatnot locating these songs that would be perfect and was placing them very judiciously, very mindfully in the script, in the story that I was creating or recreating. And every once in a while, there was not a song. It's like, hmm, you know, 
uh, I thought we really need a song for when they go to the movie theater and they start that, you could call it that theme, that dramatic theme of Hero Don't Never Die. Right. Which is very important for the whole story. It shapes, it reshapes Ivan's whole worldview, gets him to stay in Kingston, and totally it informs everything he does from that moment through the end of the show. We don't have a song for that, so I'll write one. Mm. And I picked up the guitar and wrote one. It was so much fun to write. It's so much fun to see the guys do it. And then it came again. Uh, we had, I wanted to do a flip side of that for act two the consequences of heroic activity which and and pedro his dear friend pedro sings the ballad of ivan um so we see the consequences of of heroic action and then there was a moment where we the producer said um write a song for elsa Mm. (laughs) at this point they were like slp write a song for elsa and i said well might there be and they said no no no. we want you to write one for her and I said, sure. Um, right after Elsa has her first conversation with Ivan, and she walks away, and she's on her way to church, and she's just left this young man who she's feeling feelings about, and she sings the song, Him. And that was a lot of fun to write. Uh, so I picked up the guitar and wrote that one too. So I appreciate them inclu- you know, allowing me to, to, to do that. Uh, it's really super fun. So you mentioned you've been working on the show for the better part of a of a decade. Um, yeah, I, I'm interested in you know what that development process has been like, particularly you know how actors and directors and other collaborators shape a piece as it as it develops for you. Yeah, this has been a beautiful. Oh, I love this process, um, I, but again, every process is different. This one's been especially wonderful. The producers. You know, Justine Hensel contacts the producers of Washington Square Films. They contact me, and I sit with the producers and talk about what the story might be. Mm -hmm. So we do a lot of story imagining, you know what I mean? Uh, Of course, we we all watch the film at that point. I've created a a, a beat sheet, an outline, if you will, of, um, you know, the, the story beats in the film. And then... I start to imagine it on the stage with musical numbers that come out of a dramatic moment. You know, again, these characters have to sing the song. Right. I'm just interested, you know, like by the time you've got a, a draft of the script, I mean, did it go through a lot of workshops? Was Were Tony oh, we, Tacconi had, and yeah. Sergio Trujillo always yeah. attached to it? Or did they come on board at a later point? Or We had several workshops, great questions, several workshops where you take the script and take the songs and, and have a, a, a piano player, uh, just, you know, someone to, to clunk out the songs, not clunk out, but play the songs right. beautifully to give us some kind of dramatic, uh, musical context. Um, we started off with different, a different director, very different casting, you know, trying to find our, our actors, trying to find the right director for the project, trying to find the mu- right musical director for the project, trying to find the right Uh, musical supervisor for the project Mm. lots of comings and goings of folks and i was just standing there you know while people came and went um the constants were uh the story of ivan and me standing there going i'm gonna hold it down (laughs) and we will find our perfect team Mm. which I, i really believe that we have you um, have worked with a lot of heavy hitters in the directorial department, you know, over the course of your career. George C. Wolf, Oscar Eustace, yes. Tony Tacconi, Joe Bonney, you know, et cetera and so forth. They're Lee. all great directors who have yeah. different sensibilities, different visual styles, different ways of working. You know, what is it that you really look for in a director and how do you know that a particular director is the right person for a, for a given project? I look for respect. That's the word, Mm. respect. What is respect? Respect is I look at you and I see you. You look at me, you see me. Respect is a two-way street, right? It's not just you better respect me. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? It's I better respect you. I better pay attention when you speak. And I would hope that you pay attention when I speak. I should consider your ideas, right? I should value you as a, as a creative partner. All those things, 
Kenny Leon, Spike Lee, mm-hmm. George C. Wolfe, Joe Bonney, uh, Liz Diamond, when I'm lucky, Oscar Eustace, Tony Tacconi, Sergio Trujillo, all these, Steve Brodnax, Nigel Smith, who's directing plays for the right. Plague Year. Um, all these wonderful directors uh, respect me. It, it sounds like a, like one of the, another one of those woke words, you know what I'm saying? These are words that we teach, that uh, I have an 11-year-old son, and w- my husband and I, we we endeavor to help our son learn the meaning of that word. Mm-hmm. You know, that's basic human kindness. And, and when I find in my, in my collaborations, whether I'm collaborating with the muse or whether I'm collaborating with the director or whether I'm collaborating with a designer or an actor or a producer or whatever, if we have respect, we're good. Mm. If respect is lacking, either way, if I'm looking at somebody and going, she doesn't have anything to tell me, then, then it's fucked, bro. It's right. fucked. You know what I'm saying? Um, but if I look at a producer or an actor and say, well, let me, let me listen to what she's got to say. Because I'm going to learn something, whether I agree with her or not. Mm. Yeah, and you know, that's also, it seems to be one of the really important parts is how you respectfully, but still honestly, navigate conflict within a collaborative Mm -hmm. process. And Mm -hmm. obviously, you're someone who's been through a lot of collaborations over the course of your career. Uh, What what have you learned about how to have conflict in a a respectful way? way that you know both keeps the humanity intact but also does what's best for the project at the same time right you know there's this cool book i i've been reading at on my phone uh you know read a little bit and then go and do something else but uh, i think his name is sam harris and it's called on lying mm-hmm. or just lying maybe now he talks about how you know in his understanding that it's, it's never good to lie. So if it's never good to lie, then how do you tell someone what you really think? Right. In a way that's not punishing or diminishing or is going to blow, fluff them up so much that they can't, you know, see their own way anymore, you know, because Tennessee Williams talks about the, the tragedy of success. So there's, th- there's all that. But how do you, how are you real with somebody? Yeah. How can we be real with each other, right? I believe that there is, there are ways to actually just Tell someone what you honestly think. So someone gives me a note and I think it's stupid, right? I'm not going to say, gee, your note is stupid. Right. Right? Because that, is, that, that does more harm than good. I might say, I hear you. I don't know how to, that's going to work with what I'm trying to do. Can we talk about, maybe you're not seeing what I'm trying to do. Or maybe you are and you're trying to give me a note that's as helpful as you can be. But I feel like it's missing its mark. And they might keep talking and we might come to some kind of understanding. Right. Because it could be that what you were trying to do wasn't clear, right? Or, or, exactly. or isn't coming through and, and they've correctly diagnosed that problem, even if their solution is stupid. Exactly. Right. Or it exactly. could be exactly. that, that, that uh, they actually want you to be doing something different, which is a, then you need to have that argument. Exactly. And that's like, wow, I really, I appreciate what you're wanting me to do. And uh, that's not what I'm doing. Right. You just say that. That's not what I'm, I'm doing. So either you respect what I'm trying to do or you disrespect it and try to get me to change what I'm trying to do. And, 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 you, don't, and you don't respect my artistic prowess, <laughs> my artistic ability. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm, I'm not, this isn't my first rodeo. I'm, I'm good at what I do. Right. One thing we talk a lot about on this show is kind of the, I don't want to call it work-life balance, but the human side of being a creative person and an, mm-hmm. and an artist. You have had quite a banner. Uh, you know, by the end of May, you will have had quite a banner nine months or so, right? You've gone from uh, plays of the play gear at the at Joe's Pub, Top Dog Underdog on Broadway. Harder they come at the public. It, they just announced they're extending it the day before we've recorded this. Oh, wow. um, oh, and then on. you're going right back into plays for the play gear at Joe's Pub again, and they'll actually overlap. Right. Yes, I will be walking from the Newman Theater, which is on one side of the public theater lobby, to Joe's Pub, which is on the other side <laughs> of the public theater lobby. So I'll be running back and forth. But also we had last year uh, that ran in, rehearsed in August, September ran in October, part of November. We had Sally and Tom, a world premiere of a new play of mine at the Guthrie Theater in Minneapolis. Right. Of course, I completely, yes, I completely spaced <laughs> on that because of everything else you're doing. So how do you, you know, you're also a human being. For the people who don't do professional theater, I can say as someone who's done it 
it's incredibly taxing to do. Um, it's uh-huh. all sorts of other wonderful things, but it's also very taxing to do. You've been writing these things, then you're going to appear on stage in one of them. You know, how do you hold on to yourself and your life and nurture yourself as a human being in the midst of all of that? You know, when you're at peak busyness, and and how do you avoid burnout? Well, I have a wonderful core family. My husband is not only a, a great musician and a composer and a brilliant artist in his own right. He's a wonderful person. He's a great human being. Our son is 11 and he's 11. (laughs) He's he's an incredible creature. And so, but they, they give me, their energy is very nurturing and very loving. So I get a lot from being in my core uh, family. And also I get a lot of love and energy, good energy from my work, mm-hmm. which is probably why I love working because I get so much, I get such a dopamine kick from it. Um, I, I, I get more fed from my work than I do from, say, you know, going on a vacation. Right. You know, for example, I mean, a lot of people think, I need to go on a vacation. And I'm like, I need to read that book of essays, you know. Mm-hmm. So I, I mean, we're all different, you know, different people need different things. Susan Laurie Parks, thank you so much for joining us on Working to Talk About Your Process. Thank you so much, Isaac, for having me. This is so much fun. Yay. Coming up next, Isaac and I will talk about the ubiquity of adaptations and reboots and what it means to create a brand new thing out of old material. Stick around. It's time to reboot your credit card with Apple Card. Apple Card is a different kind of credit card. It gives you up to 3% unlimited cash back on everything you buy. It's real cash that never expires or loses value. And you can use it on anything. Grab a morning coffee, pick up a tab or pay back a friend. Apply now in the Wallet app on iPhone and start using it right away. Apple Card issued by Goldman Sachs Bank USA, Salt Lake City branch. Subject to credit approval. Daily cash is available via Apple Cash Card, issued by Green Dot Bank, member FDIC, or as a statement credit. Terms apply. As if the McCrispy couldn't get any better, Bacon and Ranch just entered the chat. The Bacon Ranch McCrispy, available at participating McDonald's for a limited time. ba da ba 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 That was such a wonderful conversation. And it's so funny to hear you talking with Susan Laurie about letting go, because in a way, I feel like adaptations are a way of not letting go. This Mm -hmm. is kind of the discussion surrounding all the remakes and reboots out there. Although, of course, this doesn't really fall into that bucket. But nevertheless, we're holding on to these stories that have already been told in some way. And ideally, we're doing that because we think we can add something new and important to that story, right? I mean, ideally, but let's be honest, a lot <laughs> a, a lot of it in our culture, I'm not talking about this musical, but a lot of it in our culture is just that nothing that doesn't have an existing IP attached to it can get made anymore. Yeah. You know, I, I recently saw, maybe you remember which show this was, but there's some animated show from 20 years ago that's coming back. You know, they're making new episodes of it. And um, someone wrote the creator on Twitter and is like, why are you doing this? You, the show's already over. And he said, I pitched 20 original programs to Netflix Mm. and they didn't buy any of them. And so we're doing this because I want to work, you know? And I think in that context, you know, what a lot of people are doing, like Tony Gilroy on Andor or whatever, are how can I use this existing IP to tell the story I want to tell or to explore the themes I want to explore, right? Like, hopefully that's what you're doing. But I don't know if that's always the case. In in The Harder They Come, it's a little bit different because, look, that's a historically important film and in the 70s was incredibly popular and influential. But I don't get the sense that, like... You know, the masses are crying out, where's my adaptation of The Harder They Come? I really need more of The Harder They Come. You know, the music is what's really famous about it. Mm -hmm. And I think SLP clearly felt like there was a new story that could be told with these materials that would kind of speak to today in a different way. 
Yeah, and to that end, I laughed a lot when Susan Laurie said that adaptation is her middle name, and she really has worked on a lot of them, as she mentions in your conversation. Yeah. And I was really glad that you asked her how she approaches adaptation, because I feel like if you have so many under your belt, maybe you have a better grasp on how to do it well. Her Mm -hmm. answer to your question kind of boils down to story, and as she says finding out what's needed. Funnily enough, I think that's something that's true of original work too. Would you agree? Yeah, I think that's a shared impulse. You know, the Mm -hmm. the phrasing that I always like is uh, when you're talking about creative problems you're facing with a project is what does this book or play or film or painting need? Right? Like what does it need? Because it's its own thing. And and I find Mm -hmm. that's a great way to think about it because it moves the conversation away from you and your ego. Well, look, you're not a very egotistical person. So let me say (laughs) me and my ego. Kind of you. you. (laughs) What's best for the project? Hey, you know. And I think that question can really help you not be so precious about yeah it, you know you know because it's real easy to get real precious about everything and just being like no what does this need is is i think a really helpful thing i i do want to say as well that i think that shared kinship that you're noting is also because on some level everything is adaptation right we're right. always adapting the works we've read and seen and that are important to us and influence us in some way we're we're always breaking them apart and recombining them and then adding to them that our own originality that's really what creativity is is and nothing exists in a vacuum. I really appreciate what you're saying like about being precious about stuff because I think that's kind of one of the big challenges of adaptation. Like you asked about being respectful of your collaborators because specifically in this context a lot of it comes down to working with the person whose work you're adapting and then it's like two of you having to not be precious yeah. about something. You want to be respectful of their original vision but you also want to make sure that you're not just copying what they've already done. But what does that mean to be respectful to an original story? How do you respectfully retell somebody's story? That's a really fascinating problem that I think all adapters Mm -hmm. kind of confront. You know, in this case, we're probably a little lucky in that all the original creators of the movie are dead, (laughs) right? So you are still collaborating with them, though. You know, the relationship still exists with them, even though they're not of this world anymore. And and ultimately, you have to decide, you know, how much you want to worry about what their intent may or may not have been with the project. And then, of course, as was clear in that interview, there's the additional figure of the estate and dealing with the estate. I've worked on a few adaptations, and it's really interesting to see how the original artists approach them. You know, I I think for the most part, the the best ones I've seen are when the artists are like, hey, this is yours. Make of it what you will. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm just here to support you. I'm an enthusiast. I respect you. You know, go for it. And and when they give them that sense of permission, it's really helpful. It's also helpful to get that sense of permission at the very, very beginning of the process. Uh, You know, again, in this case, you know, SLP talks talked about outlining the new story with the estate and thinking about it through with them. And also, you know, like, obviously, she's an artist of integrity. She doesn't want to feel like she betrayed the people who made this movie that she cares about. Yeah. And I do want to talk a little bit more about her approach, because I feel like it definitely frees her up to, as you say, go her own way with something. Because as long as you understand what through line is crucial for the story, you can sort of play around with everything else that's around it. And then, of course, when you're adapting something from one medium to another, you have to consider what that new medium can or can't do. And this Mm -hmm. is a slight detour, but I'm curious if there are any adaptations that you consider really successful and what in your mind is the key to that? Are you the kind of person who gets mad if an iconic line isn't carried over from one version of a story to another? No, I'm not. I think that kind of stuff is like the death of creativity. But I'm going to give you the one time that I got really pissed. You may know that there was this woe-begone musical of Spider-Man on Broadway called Spider-Man Turn Off the Dark with music by U2. And they replaced the phrase, with great power comes great responsibility, with the generic and somewhat Republican-sounding rise above. And I mean, look. Spider-Man just isn't the same character if he's not wrestling with the tension between power and duty, right? I mean, I'm not crazy. Don't they still use the line? He shouts it at the Green Goblin, like, in the middle of an argument. But it's not like Uncle Ben giving him the life Mm. lesson that's going to guide him through the rest of his life. Okay, I saw it too long ago to be able to refute any of this. (laughs) But, you know, more seriously, look, again, I think with adaptation, what matters is whether the end result is good. Good. That is actually yeah. more important than any rule about faithfulness. <laughs> you know, to give one example, the original play that King Lear is based on has a happy ending. Mm. 
Mm. Right. So like, I bet there were a lot of people at the globe. They, that place holds 3000 people. I bet, you know, 2,500 of them or whatever might've been kind of pissed that Shakespeare turned it into a tragedy, but, uh, <laughs> that's what gives the play its power. Um, yeah. and it really would have been terrible if the harder they come had opened with whatever the stage version is of a long lensed tracking shot of a bus going down a rural road for five minutes because <laughs> film's a visual medium and the stage, it just doesn't work like that. But what I, I wanted to keep talking about, though, is the difference like between these adaptations. Like, obviously, when you're taking something from one medium to another, yeah. there are huge differences, like whether it's from a game to a TV show or for totally. in, in this instance, from a movie to a stage show. And I, I sort of wonder, like, how much can you change something before it becomes a totally different thing? Like, this is the thing I wonder about a lot with adaptations, like with the Robert Downey Jr. Sherlock Holmes. I was watching this and I was like, there's no real reason for this to be Sherlock Holmes. Like, just name him something else and it would still be perfectly fine. Like, there's no reason to attach the IP to it. Yeah, I mean, it's a really interesting question. And, and some of it comes down to like, is it the spirit? Is it the mm. story? Is it the look? Like, what is it? So for example, SLP's take on The Harder They Come is far more humanist than the original film. The original mm. film is a 70s crime movie. It's pretty cynical. It's got its nihilistic side. And at the same time, the rough plot is the same. Innocent guy moves to the big city to become a music star. It doesn't work out. He's exploited in a bunch of different jobs. Mm -hmm. He turns to a life of crime. He gets killed by the police. Like the bare bones of the story are the same, even though in the film, Ivan kind of loves that he's become this gangster. Mm -hmm. You know, he kind of loves that he's now this famous figure. He kind of loves scaring people with his guns and, you know, all this other stuff. Whereas in the um, stage show, he has a very tormented experience of this. He's almost like a folk hero instead. Yeah. So does that change of the inner spirit matter? Does the plot matter? Like, what can you change and what can't you change? I actually don't know, because I think about, I don't know, like Robert Altman's The Long Goodbye, right? I mean, mm -hmm. that updates the book to the 70s. It casts Elia Gould as Marlowe, which is on its surface an insane casting <laughs> choice. And yet the ultimate film is like a great marriage of these, yeah. these sensibilities. Again, I think it's like, if you're too beholden to the original, why bother? Right. But if yeah. you don't care about the original at all, you should just call it something else and do your own thing with it. Yeah. I mean, it's so sad that it does. Well, at least like in the last few years, it does seem to just boil down a lot to money where it's like executives right. are afraid that people won't go see something if it's original and it doesn't have some kind of nostalgia value or something that will immediately draw audiences in. I know it's so weird because, I mean, like, I know you and I are both very stoked about the recent Best Picture win of Everything Everywhere All at Once, yeah. right? But, does, but you know, like, a studio owns that IP. The Daniels do not. So does that mean that, like, 50 years from now, there's going to be a, like, Everything Everywhere All at Once remake and, like, an animated <sighs> adventures across the Everything Everywhere All at Once multiverse? <sighs> like, like, what's going to happen to it? Uh, I hope that doesn't happen to it. Like, this is what I've found, like, so profoundly depressing about, like, Warner Brothers being like, we're going to make new Lord of the Rings stuff because we really want a big franchise again. And I was like, that's not a good reason to tell a story. Like, that's <laughs> not a good reason to do something. And yeah. even, like, I recently went to a preview of the new Dungeons and Dragons movie, and I was like, this is great. Like, this is really fun. Like, I really liked it. But then I went onto the Wikipedia, and it's like, they've already greenlit, like, a spinoff TV show. Like, there's already, like, books coming out about those characters. And I was like... Oh, man, this corporate synergy is like really bringing me down. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, you know, at the same time, there's a very long history. of Well, first it was plays becoming films and mm. now it's increasingly films becoming plays. Right. But but that traffic back and forth has existed since the birth of film as a medium. You know, yeah. and I will so say in terms of films being turned into plays or vice versa. Groundhog Day musical, really good. Should have gotten more awards than it did. Uh, really underrated. Andy Carl should have won the Tony that year. That's Andy Carl's amazing. Opinion. He's so good. The hard part is that they were adapting like a masterpiece, a truly flawless, <laughs> brilliant, great American film. One of the greatest American films. It's like trying to adapt Casablanca. Into they a did a good job, something. though, is what no, I think. No, I agree. I agree. But I mean, I think, again, it comes down to this like, I think that you can tell when it's a cash grab, right? Yeah. And yeah. then, and there's a difference between that and like reading something or seeing something and being like, there's something there. There's something mm -hmm. more there that I want to investigate as an artist that I want to get into that I'm intrigued by and following those questions the same way you follow the questions of any artistic project is going to lead you to interesting places. And I and I, I genuinely believe that, that that was more the process on this show than just like, uh, 
you know, Jimmy Cliff's descendants need some cash. Let's uh, get a musical together. I mean, the American theater is not a very remunerative world and it takes forever to get anything done. Well, I wish I could see the show, but I feel like I'm not going to be back in New York in time to see it. But if you are a New York listener, definitely make the time to go out and catch this show. We hope you've enjoyed our show. And if you have, remember to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, and then you'll never miss an episode. And just a reminder that by joining Slate Plus, you'll get ad-free podcasts, extra segments on shows like the Waves and Culture Gap Fest, and you'll never hit a paywall on the Slate site. To learn more, go to slate.com slash working plus. Thanks to our guest this week, Susan Laurie Parks, and to our wonderful producer, Cameron Drews, who helps us with the many rivers that we have to cross. We'll be back next week with a special episode you're not going to want to miss. Cameron is going to be in the host chair, and he talked to none other than iconic children's entertainer, Raffi Kavukian. That's right, the one, the only Raffi who soundtracked my childhood and eh, probably soundtracked yours. So you're going to want to make sure you listen to that. Until then, get back to work. Macy's is committed to creating brighter futures for all and empowering a new generation of leaders. That's why they're continuing support of Girls Inc. all throughout March. Your online or in-store donation will help fund education and career readiness programming, inspiring all girls to be strong, smart and bold. Give back and learn more at Macy's.com slash purpose. That's Macy's.com slash purpose. Hey, everybody, it's Tim Heidecker. You know me, Tim and Eric, Bridesmaids and uh, Fantastic Four. I'd like to personally invite you to listen to Office Hours Live with me and my co-hosts, DJ Doug Pound. Hello. And Vic Berger. Howdy. Every week we bring you laughs, fun, games, and lots of other surprises. It's live. We take your Zoom calls. Music. We love having fun. Excuse me? Songs. Vic said something. Music. Songs. Music. I like having fun. I like to laugh. I like to meet people who can make me laugh. Please subscribe now.